Church, welcome to our online service. We are officially launching Term 2 with a new theme today, and I trust that you'll experience the embrace of the Father this season. Today we also celebrate with those who have publicly declared their faith by getting baptized, but more on this shortly. I'll be back later to share some opportunities with you, but remember to also regularly check the Happening at Hatfield section on our website homepage for the latest news and updates. For now, stay tuned as we cross live to our service, which has just started. Happy Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I know it's a stretch for the introverts, but I think it's good for us to know one another. I want to welcome those who are joining us online and for those who will be listening to the service at, at today or some other time, you are so, so very welcome. Today we have Pastor Ian on ministry mic duty. So if during the service, you sense that you have a word from the Lord that is not just for you personally, but that it's a corporate word that could minister to the whole congregation. You are so welcome to come to the front, to my right hand side, to speak to Pastor Ian, and he will discern to see if it's a word to be released this morning within the service, or if it's something to be shared with the, with the leadership team later. I think I want to reassure you that we do take these words seriously and we pray into them so please feel free to share this morning before the service we had baptism and we really celebrate with those who are taking this step of obedience in their journey of discipleship we had 14 people baptized this morning we want to say congratulations to each one of them each one of them this morning, Pastor Louis will be starting a new series called Abba. It's a focus on the Father. As you would know, we are really focusing on the Lord and on God this year. We focused on Jesus in the first term, and Pastor Louis will be starting today with looking at Father God, who He is to us. And as I was thinking of this morning, I thought that knowing who our Father is is so important to children. Knowing what our Father is like is crucial because once we know that, it really opens the door for identity and for belonging and for security. And when we look at our lives and those of the people we interact with, oftentimes we can see when there are issues in those three areas, it's oftentimes it can be traced down to Father. And I think my prayer for us as a congregation is really that in these next few weeks, but even this morning, that the Lord will reveal to you a bit more about who the Father is, that you will have insight into His character, and that you will know that because He is the unchanging Father, who He has been to the saints in the Bible is who He is to you. So if He is the God who provides, even today, He is the God who provides. So I want to pray that as we go into worship that the Lord would speak to us, that He would continue to reveal His heart, His good Father heart to us. Father, thank You. Thank You for Your goodness. Thank You for Your Holy Spirit. Thank You that, that the Holy Spirit reveals the Father to us. And I pray that this morning and in the weeks to come, You will continue to unpack your character, that you will continue to show us who you are truly. Father, and that you will expose the lies we have been believing about the Father, about your character, about who you say we are, and that as such we can come to you with boldness and we can have a liberty because we truly believe who you say you are in your word, because you are indeed a good Father who is loving and who is kind and who is gracious and compassionate and because of that we can freely come to the throne of grace will you come and inhabit the praises of your people this morning in jesus name amen 
Good morning, church. What a privilege we have this morning to come together and just sing to our Father and just praise Him. Scripture says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So as we sing about His love, His unchanging character, His nature and who He is, won't we do that from a place where we actually decide that His joy is our strength and do that together as a family? So won't you join us as we sing, For God So Loved. no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms see his open arms for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and all son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell the power
God so loved the world, for God so loved, for God so loved, God so loved the world. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. our Father, to come with all of the things that drags us down or holds us back, you still invite us to come and lay them down at your feet, Lord. Yes, Lord, thank you that we have the privilege and honor to sing and serve such a wonderful God, a God that loves us so much, Lord. Yes, Lord, so we can come to you, Lord. We can come to you with all, all of our burdens, all of our sickness with everything and lay it down at your feet, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because are you hurting? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. 
Sing that again. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling, yes he is, so come, so come, and sing O come, O come to the altar, the Father's arms are say, oh no, your sin is too bad for you to come to me. Father, thank you that you are calling us, you're inviting us to your arms, Lord. You're standing there waiting for us, waiting for your children to run back to you. If you feel that you've been far away from God and you're undeserving of his love, I just hear the Father saying, run to me, my child. Run to my arms, I'm waiting for you. I'm calling to you. You do not have to be ashamed. You do not have to carry the guilt by yourself. Just come to me and lay it down at my feet. Just come to me. You can come to me. You can come to me. You can come to me. The Father is calling. The Father is calling. So let's lift. 
lift our voices and sing. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he
that the world doesn't know.
don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God In the space of declaring what God's love towards us is like, I would like to release a word from Pastor Seth. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what we were praying at the pre-service meeting this morning, uh, just to go straight to the point, I saw angels all around, and um, as they were flapping their wings, they were flapping their wings, and they, you know the number kept increasing, and they begin to produce a rhythm. And that rhythm was love, was love. They were flapping their wings and they were multiplying all around us. And I believe the Father is telling us this morning, don't feel unworthy. Wherever your situation is, I'm ready to pour out my love to you. you remember Songs of Solomon chapter 2 verse 4. He said, he has made me come before his banquet hall and his banner over us is love. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Pastor Seth to pray into that. If you feel that you are not worthy to come to the Father, if you feel that there are things that keeps you from accepting His love for you, His love that He already declared, His love that He already demonstrated, if there are barriers from you freely coming to the Lord, I want you to accept this prayer as for you. I'm not gonna ask you to stand if you can just close your eyes and connect with the Father. Um, he loves you and his banner over you is indeed love. Father, let your canvas of love, your banner over us indeed is love. Let your power of love, your faithfulness of love, let it permeate over this building in the name of Jesus and those who are connected with us online. Let every individual, those who are feeling unworthy, those who are being trapped, those who are being caged, let doors of love be open, oh God. Let there be emotional healing, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Let your power and your breath of love flow through right now. Break every shackles, open every door, heal every sickness, disease in the name of Jesus. Let those who are down rise up in the name of Jesus. Let your power of love flow through in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 The Lord really loves us. He really loves us. We're going to go into our time of offering. In, in Proverbs 3 verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your offering. So it's really an honor to be able to give to the Lord. And it's one of the ways that we honor Him with our lives by bringing our finances to Him. I wanted to unpack a little bit, just draw some things that the Lord has showed me from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 15. I'm not going to read through the scripture, but I want to encourage you to take out your devices and to follow along, or if you can read it through later when you get home, I would so encourage that. Um, I see it's on the screen. Thank you. Just some thoughts from there. The Lord says that we are to be generous. <laughs> It's who our Father is, it's part of His character and He's inviting us into that space that we can also be generous as our Father is. 
it says that we are to give as we have decided in our heart. There's no compulsion, there's no forcing anybody. You give what you determine in your heart to bring to the Lord. And that's, that's what He loves when we give generously out of that place of, of freedom. And it says God is able to bless us and to meet all of our needs so that we can continue to be generous. So as we give, He looks after our own needs. And He is the one who gives us our bread that we need for our own sustenance and He gives us the seed that we can give into ministries and into the lives of other people. It's God who does that. He is the one that increases our finances. He's the one that gives us increase and that allows us to be even more generous. And then also that giving is an expression of obedience that accompanies our confession of the gospel. If the gospel is indeed good news, then it means good news even in our financial spaces and it's an expression of that. And finally, our generosity leads to thanksgiving to the Lord. So ultimately, the way we give points back to the Father and people can celebrate who He is because of what we do and who we are and how we live even in our financial spaces. So may you give in freedom today. There is no compulsion, but the Lord is inviting you into a space of generosity in your giving. As you would know, there are different ways that you can give. For those who are online, the details will be on your screen if you're in the building. You are so welcome to pass the bags and I will pray for your giving. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are the generous God, that you are good. And because of who you are in your generosity, we can emulate you. We can look like our Father in our financial area. We can look like our Father in giving generously, fully believing that as we give, you are more than able to give into our needs and into our pockets so that we can sow seeds that will go further than what we can imagine. So thank you that we can walk with you and that we can look like our Father in our financial areas. In Jesus' name, amen. You're so welcome to continue passing the bags. I want to invite those who are visiting with us today. I wonder if you can put up your hand so that those next to you can give you a, a welcome smile or a welcome hug. You are so, so very welcome. If it's your first time visiting, so welcome. I see some hands. You are so very welcome. After the service, I will be in our Connect Lounge. Um, it's in our foyer hall through the back doors to my, and it will be to your left as well. There's a, a banner up and a team of our volunteers who will be welcoming you. I will be there just to tell you a little bit more about our church family who we are and what we believe and how we live it out as disciples of Jesus. So I would so love it to have tea with you and explain to you a little bit more of, of our church family. So please join me after the service in the foyer hall. We're gonna look at our opportunities for engagement within our community, our recorded announcements, after which Pastor Louis will come up and bring the word to us. Hey family, for those of you who don't already know, I'm Vida, the program coordinator at Year of Your Life, Hatfield's very own Christian Gap Year program. Our Gap Year is for young people aged 18 to 26 who are ready to grow in God and be changed forever. Module 2 registrations are now open, so parents or guardians, we invite you to enroll your child or children who are out of school before 29 April. Visit our website at yearofyourlife.co.za for more information. Are wedding bells in your near future? As in, you're engaged and preparing for marriage? Well, today is the last day to sign up for Becoming One, our seven-week marriage preparation course, which starts this Wednesday, 24 April. Skalk and I did Becoming One, and the topic that stood out the most for me was conflict. We learned how to manage conflict well, by attacking the challenges together 
instead of attacking each other during the challenges. I encourage you to sign up if you want to start your marriage off on a solid foundation. To register today for 500 Rand per couple, email hope at hatfield.co.za or visit the happening section on our website homepage. On the same evening, the rest of us can attend the worship and prayer evening at 7.30 p.m. in the Minor Auditorium. This monthly gathering is an opportunity to press deeper into heartfelt worship, fervent prayer, and the prophetic. Come see God's face on your own, or with a family member or your community group. Lastly, young adults, if you are looking for a space where you can socialize and go deeper with God, our Hatfield Young Adults Monthly Connect Redeemed Rhythm is the place for you. Learn a group dance for a solid hour to get the endorphins going and then dive into matters of the Bible. Diarize the following dates. There's no cost involved, just show up with comfortable shoes to dance in and your Bible and notebook. That's all from me today. Visit the Happening at Hatfield section on our website for all these and more updates. Bye! Good morning, family. How's everybody doing? Wonderful. It's good to be together today. We are starting with our new series, as mentioned earlier, that is entitled Abba. We, we want to call it Abba because if we call it Abba, then you've got all sorts of other images and songs like Happy New Year, Super Trooper, money, money, money flowing through your, your brains at the moment. We actually considered whether during this season of this theme of Abba, whether we shouldn't use money, money, money during the offering times, but we felt that might not be the wisest thing to do. So... Um, because we were going to get Lena to come and sing it, and you know, that. okay. So we are looking forward to, in our theme for this year, which is about knowing God, and we, we're just diving in a little bit deeper into who is God and understanding His person, His character, and the things that He does. And so the first time we had a great time with fixing our eyes on Jesus, and now we are considering Abba, our Father God. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Why does he say that? If that statement is true, why is it true? Because simply what you think about God is the thing that shapes the rest of your life. How you think about God, who you think he is, what he does, everything else is shaped by that. Now, sometimes people say they don't believe in God, but even that is a statement of faith, is it not? In this room, I would guess that most of us would feel comfortable to say that we are people of faith. We believe. But I want to tell you, everybody believes. Everybody has faith. Everybody has an opinion about God and base their life on that opinion. I don't know if you've heard the story about these two brothers that were the worst criminals in their town. One of them died. So the surviving brother went to the local priest and said, I will pay you $10 million if you bury my brother. But there's one provision to the funeral if you want this money. And that is that when you do the ceremony, you have to actually use the words, these specific words, and say that my brother was a saint. And so the priest was quiet for a couple of minutes and considered this, and they says, yes, no problem, it's, it's a deal. And so he took the money, and eventually they came to the ceremony. And uh, at the graveside, the priest proceeded to say the following, this man was a thief, a rapist, a liar, and a crook. There wasn't one good thing about him. Then he looked at the brother in the audience and continued, but compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> What you think about God is the most important thing about you because it will also say what he thinks about you and ultimately what you think about yourself. I went onto a chat site uh, in preparing for this message and um, I looked and, and I just searched and found people responding to the statement that everyone has to believe in something. Everyone has to believe in something and they asked people, what do you Think of, what do you say in response to that statement? And here's some of the responses. One said, I believe in anything that has been proven by evidence. 
otherwise known as non-supernatural. Another person said, surely I believe in friendship, love, and helping others. One person said, I believe in beer. Another person said, I believe in science, and that requires no faith whatsoever. No faith whatsoever. I want to tell you, everybody has to practice faith. If you believe something to be true, that will ultimately require faith. Frank Zappa, the famous musician, said, everybody believes in something, and everybody, everybody by the virtue of that fact, the fact that they believe in something, uses that something to support their own existence. Often we are made to feel like we are less intelligent because we dare say we are people of faith. Like there are others that say, no, they don't have faith. They only believe the hard facts. Like this person said, I believe in science and that requires no faith whatsoever. It makes me think of the Christian that wanted to invite a friend to go to church with him. And so they invited the friend to go to church with her. But the friend said, I don't want to go to church. That place is filled with hypocrites. So the Christian responded, well, then one more wouldn't matter. <laughs> it's easy that sometimes people in this world that claim that they don't have to have faith, they just believe facts, scientific facts, they believe things that have been proven to act like they are not people of faith. But I want to tell you today, they are hypocrites. Everybody has to have faith. Everybody believes something to be true. Because even if you say, for instance, I do not believe in God, do you recognize today that that is a statement of faith? Because on what do you base the fact that you don't believe in God? There's no way you cannot prove God's existence. Like you can't prove his existence, you can't prove that he does not exist. So if you say, I don't believe in God, even that is a statement of faith. Because you're basing that on something. You're saying, for instance, that I have not found evidence. So what, where do you put your faith then? If I'm saying, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in evidence. So that's a faith statement. It is a statement of belief. An atheist was seated on an airplane next to an old farmer. And he turned to the farmer and he said, do you want to talk? Flights go quicker if we have conversations. And so the farmer said, okay, that's great. What would you want to talk about? So the atheist said, oh, I don't know. Let's talk about why there is no God and no heaven or hell and life after death. And uh, he sort of smiled smugly as he looked at the farmer. The farmer responded and said, well, that could be a very interesting conversation. That could make this flight go shorter. But if we start the conversation, can I ask you a question? The atheist said, of course you can ask me a question. He said, Deer, horses, and cows all eat the same thing. Grass. Do you, do you agree? The atheist said, yes, I agree. He said, well, then explain to me that when they excrete, sorry, this is a bit graphic, but when they excrete, deer comes out in pellets, cows comes out in flora plat patties, horses comes out in like lumps. Why is that the case? The atheist was taken a little bit aback by this question, and he said, he said, I don't understand. He said, well, if you don't even understand that, I don't think you qualify to have a conversation about God and if he doesn't exist. You don't seem to understand poop even. <laughs> now, you could use another word, which I'm not going to do, so I'm Christianizing the story. When I say I believe in nothing, that is a statement of belief. When I say I have faith in nothing, that is a statement of faith. Because I have to use some basis for that statement. And so you and I, that are people of faith, that, that are people that declare we believe in God, shouldn't feel that we are any less intelligent or reasonable or scientific than anybody else. We are just open about the fact that we have faith. And that we believe. If I say to you, I believe in science, everything must be proven scientifically, that is a statement of faith. And you and I have to understand that. The scripture takes this idea and draws it out a little bit. Jeremiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. 
And I think he, he gives us a very wonderful portion of Scripture that is actually helpful to us that live in pluralist societies. We live in a society which encourages and embraces that you can believe whatever you want. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. I think that reflects something of the idea that God said he gives us, gives us a free will. We can believe in him or not believe in him. That's up to us. We can choose. So you, we live in a society where you can believe that in astrology that gaseous bodies thousands and thousands of millions of miles away has an impact on your personality. You're welcome to believe that if you want to. You're welcome to believe that crystals that were formed by a million years of pressures under the earth, if you appropriate them correctly, can heal you. You're welcome to believe that. You, you can believe that there are little green men living on other planets and that they actually seeded the earth and created us. You're welcome. You can believe that if you want. You can believe in any of the kind of gods that we have on this earth. That's your choice. You are so welcome to believe that. And I want to even defend that ability that you have and that right you have. Not just from a legal basis, but from a scriptural basis. To say, we shouldn't be angry with anybody that believes different than I do. That's their right. But while it may be my right to believe whatever I want to, I have to recognize that all beliefs aren't equal. And that all things you believe aren't going to have the same power to sustain your life. You can believe something, but that something may not be strong enough to hold you. Again, Mr. Zappa said, everybody believes in something, and everybody by virtue of the fact that they believe in something uses that something to support their own existence. What we believe is what we build our lives upon. Now, if I build my life on the belief that aliens created life on this planet, then I better hope at some point somebody discovers an alien. Because if we never discover aliens, then my faith is not going to bear the test of time. But I can believe that. You can believe that if you sacrifice a chicken, that will make you have better luck in life. You're welcome to believe that. But you have to test whether at some point that actually works. Does that bear the consistency of time and of life? Because what we believe matters. What we believe gives us the parameters to live in. It explains life and things around us. And it needs to have a coherent form, uh, provide us with coherent explanation to what, what is, who I am, what exists, how things work. The Bible in the scriptures, Jeremiah, says the following in Jeremiah 17, verse 5. He says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. And when I read this scripture, I realize that Jeremiah is not saying God will curse you if you don't believe in him. As much as he was saying that if you don't believe in God, there's going to be a natural consequence to that. That if you, put, if you don't believe in God, if you're not prepared to put your faith and your trust in God, you've got to put it somewhere else. Everybody believes in something. The challenge is just that whatever else you put your faith in, it's not going to sustain you. It's going to fail at some point. So he says here, cursed is the one who trusts in man. Why are you cursed when you trust in man? Because man just doesn't qualify for you to put your faith in man. Man, as wonderful as man is, created in the image of God, is not God. I think it should be logical, it shouldn't be hard for me to prove to all of you that man has limitations. There are certain things we just can't do. There are certain things we just don't have the strength for, we don't have the capacity for, we don't have the intellect for, as clever as we can be. 
Let's say, for instance, I apply this in a very personal way and say, I'm going to put my trust in man. And, and how that's going to manifest in my life is I'm putting my, my trust in the person I'm married to to be the person that will keep me happy in life. That's a way we sometimes put our trust in man. My happiness depends on the person that I'm married to. I'm putting faith in that person, that that person will actually cause me to have the life I want to have, to have, you know, they, they will spend the money I need them to spend on me. They will do, they will love me. They will cherish me. They will be kind to me. I put my faith in them. How many of you think that's a clever thing to do? You don't seem so convinced about that question. As wonderful and as godly as marriage is, as beautiful as it is, as much as I believe in marriage, I cannot put my marriage partner in a space to say, my happiness depends on you. Why not? Why can't I do that? Well, first of all, I think it's a pretty challenging idea to say I put my hope and faith in a marriage partner because that means everybody that's not married, sorry for you now, You've got no chance of happiness. You've got to go look somewhere else. Now, Jesus challenges that idea. He wasn't married, and he was okay. He looked pretty happy to me, up until the cross, I think, but, you know. <laughs> Paul wasn't married. He talks a lot about being fulfilled. and So for that reason, I go, okay, well... Happiness may bring marri may, uh, marriage may bring happiness to some people, but it's, it's, not, it's not the cure-all for everybody. And secondly, if you're saying to me, I want to put my happiness in the hands of the person I'm married to, that they're going to do, be everything to me that keeps me happy in life, then my response to you will be, I just don't want to be married to you. Because I can't do that. I'm sorry. As much as I love my wife and I love her with everything within me, there's limitations to my love because of my own fallibility, my own challenges, my own stuff. And I'm so glad that she understands that I love her and I want to love her in the best way that I can, but that sometimes I'm not going to be able to live up to what I actually want to do. And she accepts that because she doesn't put her faith for her happiness in me. She's got somewhere else to put it. So let's say, okay, we're not going to put it in marriage. Let's put our happiness in science. Science is going to be the thing that's going to make us feel like we're secure and everything makes sense. And we, because we, we can scientifically prove things, that means life is good. Do you recognize that at the end of the day, if you're saying you put your faith in science, you're actually putting your faith in man? Because what is science? It's a discovery by men of how things work. Through good processes, word, trustworthy processes normally. But it is still somewhere in a laboratory. There's a guy with a white coat and thick glasses that doing the experiments and thinking up things and will come up and publish his theory and we go, I trust science. You trusting that guy. And I don't know if you've noticed, but they keep changing the theories. It's like trusting dietitians. You put five dietitians in a room and you've got seven diets. Sorry for the dietitians. I, I, I know you all, you know, do good and perhaps I should listen to you a bit more, you know. But it's like science. I, I love science. I, I believe science has a place. We should celebrate science. I, I appreciate scientists. Saved and unsaved. They have a, it's fantastic because what does science do? From, me, from my perspective, what science does, it discovers what God has done. So it's fantastic. I have no problem with it. But I'm just going to recognize that the people that are doing the science are limited. I, I don't know if you've heard, I, I think I saw correctly, that we're now thinking that the theory of dark matter that we've had for long, it wasn't correct. We're changing the theory. Praise the Lord. I have no problem with that. Thank you. Keep on investigating till we find. But while you're doing that, it's okay if I put my faith somewhere else. 
Because you keep changing things. So whatever you believe in must stand the test of the challenges of this life and of this world. And that's what Jeremiah says. He says, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Why are you cursed? Because no matter what I put my trust in, at some point, it's going to fail me. If I put my trust in a husband or a wife, at some point they're going to fail me. Guaranteed. Please, if you're dreaming about getting married, don't think your husband or wife is going to be the exception. You have to be prepared that things are going to go wrong at certain times. Amen? You don't look so convinced about <laughs> like, what am I doing? Am I like stepping on territory here that's like, people are like, what? All the young people are like, no! What are you talking about? There's a special person God created just for me. And they're going to be perfect. And we're going to have the perfect marriage. What are you doing? Forgive me. Anything other than God I put my trust in will at some point let me down. Now, some belief systems will take you further before it fails you than others. But they're all going to fail at some point if God is not the core of it. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the past places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. That scripture doesn't mean people that don't believe in God are poor and people that believe in God are rich. Are we, or, do you agree with me? That's not what that scripture means. What that scripture is trying to communicate to us is that there's something that we need to be rooted in to draw life from so that we may flourish. If you disconnect it from that thing, it will manifest in your life. And you will begin to experience the challenges. You will begin to see the failure of your belief system in your life, eventually. At first it may look like it works, but eventually it will fail you. And then you will begin to experience the desert experience of drought of lack of food, of lack of sustenance, of lack of water, because your belief system is failing you. Let's see the opposite and try and understand that a bit better. In verse 7 and 8 of Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. What is, what is he talking about? He's saying, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. That's the key point. That's the key thing. Cursed is the one who trusts in anything other than God. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Why? Is that some magic formula? Does that open me up if I believe in God to some supernatural world of blessings that I don't have if I don't believe in God? Perhaps, but that's not the idea of the scripture. Let's see what he means by the language he uses. He says, they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. What he's saying to us is there is a river that flows which is the river of life. Everything that wants to live needs to draw from that river. That river flows throughout creation. Where does that river come from? If you follow that river to its origin, you will find God. The giver, the author of life. Remember in our series on fixed, we said Jesus is the, the author the sustainer and the perfecter of life. Everything that exists comes from him. He is that, Jesus said, if you drink from me, you will never thirst. 
because he is the water of life. So there's this current of life that flows in throughout all creation. I'm not talking about some mystical river. I'm talking about God's presence, God's being. He sustains everything. This is this river of life. Now, if you choose to not have your roots in that river, at some point you're going to run out of life because there's no life to be found outside of that river. So you can be like a tumbleweed in the desert that's out there wanting to be free and do your own thing and choose what you believe and be happy in your belief system. And you, you may have, you know, find some moisture in the desert, but at some point that moisture is going to run out and then you're going to like, you know, basically die and you're going to just be blown around by the wind in the desert. Hey, at least you'll be free. Free to be dead. Free to do your thing. You can blow, go where the wind blows you. Or you can be like a tree that figures out, hey man, if I want to grow and flourish and have fruit, I need to get too close to the water as I possibly can. So the tree plants itself by the river, close to the river, and then sends its roots into the river and keeps drawing from the river of life. That tree, that tree has access to life because this river flows. This river has flown from eternity past and it will continue to flow in eternity in the future. Why? Because this river is God, is the origin of it. He is the one that sustains life. So he's feeding life. So this river is always going to be there. It's always going to have life in it. So if the tree puts its roots into this unchanging, unaltered river of life, then he says, it does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. Why doesn't it fear when the heat comes? Now, isn't it fantastic that the scripture doesn't say, hey man, if you've got your tree, roots in the tree of life, you're going to have no problems. No, he says the heat's going to come. The drought will still come. The challenges are still going to happen. But you don't have to fear those challenges. Why? Because you are rooted in life. And so even when, my, when, my, when the sun hits my tree and I'm going through a difficult time and my leaves are withering and my, and my fruit falls off and I look really sad, but as long as my roots are in that river, the leaves will come back, the fruits will be restored because it has to because this river is life. You can believe whatever you want. But all beliefs aren't equal because all beliefs don't have the river of life. And so I want to be this tree. The, the original language, the picture of this tree is a particular type of bush that you find in the desert in that part of the world, which evidently is really good at sending its roots deep. It seems to have the ability to break through really hard ground and even crack through rocks sometimes to find the water. And it flourishes. In the most remarkable places, you find greenery because there's the deep water. And that's what Isaiah is saying to us. There's deep water in this world. There's ancient water. There's everlasting water. Find it. If you want to live. You see if I say I don't believe. Then I'm not looking for the ancient water. If I say I believe. In man. Then I don't want to do the trouble of going deep. I just want to find the surface stuff. If I say I believe in myself. It's okay you can do that. But again. I don't want to have to do the hard work. I'll just believe in whatever's close and handy. And again, that's, you're welcome to do that. But at some point, you're going to fail yourself. You're going to not be able to answer or understand certain things. You're not going to be able to do certain things. So I want to be rooted in this tree of life, or this river of life. I want to send my roots down deep. And that's what God wants. He's consistently drawing us into himself into this river, into this life. Not 
not in a new age way where we disappear and just become part of the river that flows for eternity. No, I exist. I'm made by God. I'm an individual being with a freedom of choice. Do I want to be in this river or not? But when I choose to be in this river, God is saying to me, draw deeper and deeper and deeper. And sometimes that means I have to deal with the challenges of life. Because this world is a desert. It's a broken, dysfunctional world that throws at me all the stuff trying to say God doesn't exist and God is not good and God is not real and God can't sustain you. But a person of faith says, no, I believe God created. I believe he is good. And so I'm going to keep looking till I find his goodness. It may mean that I have to push through some stuff, but I'm going to keep looking. I was in England a number of years ago, Natasha and I, visiting my mom when she was stationed there. And one night, there was a, so over a December time, and one night a, a strong wind came through the city of London. And the next morning I read in the newspaper, over a million trees were uprooted that night because of this storm. And I said to Natasha, I, I, we, felt, we saw the wind, we felt, it didn't really feel that bad. Why does a million trees get knocked over? And then some, uh, the day, day later, I read somewhere, the reason so many trees fell over in the storm in London is because they have so much rain, the trees don't have deep roots. So when this wind blew, the trees just fell over because they had no deep anchoring, no deep roots, just shallow roots because they didn't need deep roots. Now, because we live in a broken, fallen world that is not reflecting completely who God is and His way of life, this river sometimes flows really deep, but it's there. And so what God does is He draws me. He says, come, look. And He draws my roots deeper and deeper. And so when I go through times where perhaps, you know, I, I get a really bad diagnosis for a disease or I have a crisis or a trauma or a failure of relationships or, you know, I lose my job, I have no money, whatever, those become times when I say, okay, okay, Lord, I believe you are good all the time and all the time. Okay, I'm going to do that again. I believe God is good and all the time. Okay, so I believe that. It doesn't really feel like it at the moment. I don't see your goodness. It's tough. But Lord, help me to let my roots go deeper. Push through the hard soil. Because I know you are good. I'm going to keep looking for that river. And then the scripture says, I, the scripture says, this God is present. He is near. I will find that river. And so even though I go through a season of drought, I don't have to fear drought. Because there is a river. And that's what my faith does for me. So that eventually when I find the river, I, I can, okay, the life flourishes again. Does that make sense to you? But a, but a person that does not want to put their faith in God will then say, well, why did God allow this to happen? And, you know, where's God when you need him? And, you know, all this nice stuff. And then they'll say, oh, I don't believe in God. And then they turn to something else. And they say, I'm going to look to you. You are going to help me explain my struggles or ignore my struggles or live a life where I just don't care or another philosophy that tries to help me explain all of this and, and, I, and I remove my roots and I put it in something else. The problem is there's no deep river there. Your roots are going to seek and seek and at times it's going to feel like they found something. Wow, it's fantastic. But just wait a while. The moisture is going to run out again because there's no deep river because God has sole ownership of life. All belongs to him. And so I'm saying, Lord, help me be that tree that seeks you, that, that I don't have to fear when the heat comes. I don't worry in the year of drought. I, I, I know I will bear fruit because of who you are, because of your goodness. And that, I think for me personally, matters a lot. You know why it helps me? And the title of today's message is Unchanging Father. 
Because it tells me in this ever-changing world, there's a father that doesn't change. There's a father that never changes. My environment changes. My circumstances change. My context changes. I change. Sometimes because I want to, sometimes not because I want to. Everything in my life is consistently in flux and in movement. But I'm so thankful I'm, I'm drawing from a river that never changes. I'm drawing from a God. I have a God in the center of my life who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that I read about Abraham, Moses, David, Ruth, Esther. The same God that I read about Paul, Matthew, and Luke, Priscilla, and Aquila. The same God is the God I worship. That gives me a fixed point, a certainty that to me really matters. Now, as you know, I'm a father of four children. And I've noticed as a father how my moods affect my children. The insecurity I create in them when they don't know what dad are they getting today. Amen? And sometimes I'm this dad in the morning and by the evening I'm another dad. And you see children, whenever they're in a family and the parents are unstable, forever changing, and they're uncertain, what are the rules today? And mom has these rules and dad has these rules. You see these children, they are consistently like trying to figure out, now where, how do I live life? Which parent am I dealing with? You know, I know how to keep this dad happy, but I don't quite know how to keep this one happy. And over time, if that inconsistency is constant in their life, the constant inconsistency, it breeds insecurity, and insecurity begins to breed attention-seeking. It breeds wanting to have security, and that means you're testing the boundaries all the time. You're trying to figure out how far can I go with it, and that becomes to present itself as rebellion eventually. And you end up and you say, oh, yes, I've got such a difficult teenager. Now, some teenagers are just difficult. Hormones, praise the Lord. I'm not blaming parents. It's not what I'm doing. But I had to recognize the impact my moods have in my children's lives. Now, imagine if God was moody. If you didn't know which God are we dealing with today. We come to church today I hope it's the nice God that is there. I hope it's the God that had a good night's rest. I hope the other church, imagine you had a church with two services. I hope the first service guys did a good job. Otherwise, we're going to get the grumpy God. Sorry for the young adults in the evening. We've messed up by the day. It's like you, you get God that's tired and cranky. and No, we don't. How many of you know that whenever you step and you say, our Father... You get the same Father. You have the same God. He loves you. When I've just messed up and I come and stand before Him, it's the same Father as when I've just done really well. It's the same Father. He is the unchanging God. Because He never changes, this river never changes. If he was a God that was susceptible to what we do and our fluctuating lives, then this river wouldn't be stable. Then at some point God will say, I've had enough of you. I'm going to pull up the, I'm going to close the sluice gates. Done. But he's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. His unchanging nature. That, by the way, is why the scripture means so much to me. Because think about it. When you go read the Bible, you're reading stories about people, some of them 1,500 plus years ago, 3,500 plus years ago, living in a very different culture, in a very different context, in a very different world than you and I are living in. When Moses talks about tablets, he's talking about pieces of stone and a chisel. When I talk about a tablet, 
Wouldn't it have been easy if God just gave the Ten Commandments? Okay, yeah, there we go. Distribute it, email it to everybody. Now he has to chisel it out on a piece of stone, say to Moses, and then Moses breaks it and God has to do it again. It's a whole palaver. I mean, those guys didn't understand cars and helicopters and the internet, the global village. Most people in the time of Jesus didn't go 120 miles beyond their hometown. They had no living concept of the rest of the world. That's why some people will say, how can you read an ancient text and think it can help you today? Aren't the Bible's laws not applicable today anymore? So let's say, for instance, the Bible has all these laws about sex and what it says about sex. That's an ancient society. Come on, people. We're modern people now. We've progressed. We've, you know, we understand things better. We, we know biology. You know, we've, you know, we know. We've figured it out. We've got psychologists, anthropologists. We, those guys didn't have it. They didn't have a clue, so they, they did the best they could. But we know a lot better. So those laws shouldn't count to us anymore, the ancient laws in the modern world. Now, you're missing one vital thing when you think that. And it's this, to remember the Bible is not, firstly, a book that tells us how to live life. What is the Bible, firstly? It is a book that tells us who God is who God is and when you know who he is then you begin to see how life should be lived so the same God that appeared to Abraham is the same God I'm going to meet today now Abraham might not hear God speak to him through a song playing on the radio like I may but it's the same God speaking He's not going to sound different than he did back then. And that's what the scripture is about. It's firstly about showing us who God is. When I understand that, then that ancient text helps me today to figure out how to live life in the context of a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, the way God felt about sex 3,000 years before Christ is the same way he feels about it today. And the parents clapped, and everybody else was like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to another church. I don't like this. Amen? Now, I'm not. The way God applied some of those things, he spoke differently than he does today, but he's still consistent with his nature. And that's very important to understand. Because God is unchanging. The, the psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 89 to 90, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. You are the same. Your word is eternal. What is God's word? It is his self-revelation. It's his declaration of this is who I am. It doesn't change. It is eternal. Psalm 90, verse 1 to 2, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the world, whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You are God. We don't worship the same way they worshiped even in the New Testament, but we worship the same God. Amen? We don't worship the way they worship in the rural towns of India. But it doesn't matter. They worship the same God. Luke loves Indian music and sitars and all of that. If it was up to him, we'd all be feeling like we're living in a village in India somewhere sometimes. Uh, you know, bless you. So I just haven't developed my taste to that extent yet. But it, contextual stuff can change. God can handle that because he's unchanging. You don't have a moody father. You don't have a father that loves you more sometimes and less other times. He is a consistent, the, the, the theological term for that is he is immutable. A.W. Pink said, for he is already perfect. And being perfect, he cannot change for the worse because he's perfect. He also can't become better because he's perfect. He's perfect. Somebody said, what a beautiful comfort knowing God doesn't change. 
While we see in different portions of Scripture that he responds differently in different situations, his essence, his nature, who he is does not change. Spurgeon said, he wrote this, but God is perpetually the same. He is not composed of any substance or material, but is spirit, pure, essential, and ethereal spirit, and therefore he is immutable. He remains everlastingly the same. There are no furrows in his eternal brow. No age hath palsied him. No years have marked him with the mementos of their flight. He sees ages past, but with him it is ever now. He is the great I am, the great unchangeable. And that's when Moses said to God, who are you? Tell me your name. God said, I am. Because God can only refer to himself by himself because there's nobody else like him to compare to him. Nothing else is unchangeable, but he never changes. Everything else changes. Psalm 102, verse 25 to 27 says, In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing you will change them, and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. Worship team, will you guys join me, please? All the people dressed so nice in their black outfits. Does it bring you comfort? Does it bring you a sense of peace? Provide you with a sense of rest? A, a sense of certainty? That while everything else changes, and I'm so susceptible to these changes. I mean, the rand dollar affects me. The petrol price affects me. The interest rate affects me. Everything that's up and down affects me. My health affects me. My children's moods. My wife's perfect. My children's moods, they affect me. <laughs> you know? I know some of you are going to talk to her. So, I was... <clears throat> You know, everything affects me. The weather affects me. I change my mind five times in a day. I feel certain about something yesterday. Tomorrow I'm like, oh, what did I ever think? Isn't it so glad? Oh, so fantastic. That with all of that stuff, I've got a place to go to to say, thank you, Lord. I can rest. I feel the fluctuations. I feel the changes. It impacts on my life. The life of a Christian is not this, hee hee. We feel nothing. The eternal blood, like, you know, eternal, like, just, what am I trying to say? <laughs> numbness, that's the word. The eternal numbness of the believer. It's like, nothing matters. No, we feel it like everybody else. The difference is just, my roots go deeper. My roots go deeper. There's an election coming in our nation, and I think we're all a bit apprehensive. We don't quite know what's going to happen. No, this is the election where everybody's uncomfortable. And I feel it. I'm like, oh, please, Lord. And we have to pray. But can we say, God doesn't change. The president may change. God doesn't change. He's faithful. So sometimes... I sit with people, and as the pastors do, and as some of you have done, that lost a loved one, and they're really stre stressing, struggling. And they're asking the difficult question, where was God? And then sometimes I say to people when I'm sitting with them, and they say, like, oh, you know, where's God? Why did God allow this? And they're wrestling with all that stuff. and They're feeling the heat. I say to them, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. But what I can tell you, it's better to have somebody to ask that question to than to turn away from him and ask that question into the wind. Sometimes life prevents me with challenges. I don't know how it works. But I'm glad I, I want to stay and say, Lord, I'm going to keep asking you this question. I'm going to keep because at some point you're going to help me. Perhaps you're not going to explain it to me, but you're going to help me get through this because you, your liver of life will keep feeding me. But if I turn away from him and I start saying, why did this happen? Who am I asking that question to? There's no hope. Amen? Won't you stand with me? So I want to encourage you today, firstly, two things I want to 
encourage you. First of all, don't let anybody look down on you because you're a person of faith. Everybody believes something. What you believe is reasonable. What you believe can be trusted. It is consistent. And it really speaks to life. So don't let somebody look down on your faith. And secondly, keep your faith in the unchanging Father that you have. This unchanging Father. This consistent Father. This Father that has declared over you, like Seth said earlier, His banner over you is love. And that banner doesn't change. Why doesn't the banner change? Because He can't change. I am love. He's love. He loves me. And that is consistent. So can I ask us just to take a moment as the team's just going to lead us. And I would love to give you a moment to just respond. Because I know like me, you are facing life and the challenges and the difficulties. Perhaps you're in a space where you go, okay, I'm okay. My faith is secure. But perhaps you're in a space where you're going, my faith is a bit stretched at the moment. I've got, I'm struggling. Can we take a moment and just lift our eyes to the Father and recognize Him? And say, Lord, help my roots go deeper. Help my roots go deeper. I feel the wind blowing, but I'm not going to fear them because you will sustain me. Can we do that, guys? Thank you. Just a minute or two, and then I'm going to pray and release you. I've heard thousand stories of what they think you're like. Thank you that you came to introduce us to your Father in a more intimate and clear way. That this Father that you've known for eternity, that you came and said, let me show you the Father. Thank you, Father, that we can know you. 
Thank you for who you are. That there is place with you for every single one of us. You made us to know you and to be with you. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that anyone, as we had that word earlier, that feels like we don't have access to you, feel removed from you, feel disowned by you, feel rejected by you. I pray this morning that that lie of the enemy will be broken in Jesus' name. And that every one of us will feel the freedom to turn to you, to run to you, to be embraced by you, to be welcomed by you, to hear those words, this is my beloved son and daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. And I pray for that. I pray for a spirit of adoption in our midst, that, that spirit that will cry within us, Abba, Father, you are my Father. And I thank you for that today in Jesus' name. I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that you are the same. And therefore, Lord, we, will, we, we, we pray that by your Spirit, you will break the power of fear in our lives in Jesus' name. That we will arise in hope. That peace will guard our hearts and our minds. That there will be security within us because we know you. And I thank you for that today in Jesus' name. I want to invite you, if you need prayer this morning because you're facing those challenges, just want somebody to come and pray with you and stand with you in the love of the Father, then please come to the front at the end of the service. It may be today that you have not put your faith in God. Our team's ready. They will help you to make a confession of faith, to say, I believe that I have free access to God because of the substitutionary death of Jesus. And come, let them pray with you and help you to turn your life to Jesus and give you, your life to Him that you may know God and this river of life. And then I pray for you that as you go, that you will experience just His presence, His unwavering love for you every day and that you'll be able to carry that to other people on your front line. Please remember those that are new visiting with us to meet with Liana in the Connect Lounge at the, at, as we end the service now. And uh, as we end, please come forward for prayer. Thank you to those that joined us online and on the radio. May the Lord also bless you and just go with you during this week. Bless you.
Thank you for tuning in today, church. If you have any prayer needs, send an email to prayforme at hatfield.co.za and our ministry team will gladly serve you. To be connected to our community or to find out more, send an email to hello at hatfield.co.za or simply visit our website homepage and scroll down to the Happening at Hatfield section. Goodbye.